You are watching Wide Field with Vivian Burchill. Welcome to the show. I'm Vivian Kopsinger Birchall, your host. And my guest yet again is Rebka, who is an immigrant from Ethiopia, but uh, works at Johns Hopkins University and is so passionate about Africa, African history, diversity, culture. Rebka, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be back here with you, Vivian. And for the sake of our viewers who have not met you before or had uh, watched you before, could you please introduce yourself and what you do? Absolutely. Um, again, my name is Rupka Atanafu. It means Rupaka. And I immigrated from Ethiopia in 1976 at the age of 15 and I, as a high school student uh, without my parents. So it was a little bit of a struggle, uh, but I overcome all that uh, challenges. And um, I now currently work in uh, the area of public health and research at uh, Johns Hopkins uh, School of Public Health and School of Medicine. I also have my own uh, company, R&D Associates, here in, in, uh, in the U.S. and RDA Africa, uh, headquartered in Ethiopia. So that's it with me. And I am married and have two sons. And then through... Um, when I got remarried, I actually uh, and got two daughters too. So we're a wonderfully blended family of four kids and um, husband and wife. Well, that is exciting. And the reason I needed you to get, give that introduction is because today we're talking about Black history, but there's going to be some emphasis on our heritage as immigrants from Africa and what this month means to us. So uh, first question I'm asking you, Repka, is what does Black history mean to you? Ha, ah, Black History Month means really every single day in my life really is, is Black history. And the way I live, the way I breathe, the way I interact with people, the way I work, everything is about my uh, African-American identity and, and, and culture and history and contribution. Uh, so the only thing that's different really is that this month kind of amplifies that and I become a little bit more aware and more um, intentional. I tend to actually uh, read a bit more around African-American history, uh, watch um, uh, videos, documentaries, and in fact, I've registered to watch a documentary out to tonight, and it is about uh, African-American diplomats that were so much respected in foreign lands, but they were not right here in their own backyard. Uh, and that is being organized, the Black Professional and International Affairs. So check that out um, if you're interested. Um, so every day, and, and I am re actually reminded uh, when I was in high school, I, again, and I was specifically in 11th grade, I remember it's like etched in my mind, Vivian. And um, I loved uh, the European history class and I loved our, our history professor. It was an amazing guy. And we were talking about the Roman Empire. And at one point I raised my hands and I said, yeah, well, you know, Ethiopia defeated the Italians. And then all of a sudden the conversation sh shifted from uh, this huge Rom Roman empire and their influences to say, for, the, for, my prof for my teacher whom I loved very much to dismiss my comment and said, that doesn't mean much because they were not great warriors anyway. I was like, really, that was my awakening, uh, really, Vivian, that we need to own our history and we need to tell our history because otherwise it's being minim minimized uh, or not told at all or discredited. 
And so that was my introduction. And I said, oh, my goodness, I need to be a little bit more intentional about this kind of stuff and really read and, and fight the fight and fight the struggle. And that's what African-Americans have done for many, many years. Uh, so I'm really glad that we currently have various um, movie producers and writers that, you know, uh, more than in the past that are very intentional about owning our history and telling our history from our perspective. Um, and I am married um, to an African-American uh, from uh, uh, Haitian um, heritage. So together we're really more intentional about what we talk about and what we see, what we read uh, during this month around, uh, around African-American um, history. And, and I remember when I mentioned to my mom, uh, you know, like scared to tell her that I was really dating. And this is like, I was in my fifties and still scared to tell my mom <laughs> I'm dating. And uh, because our, you know, our culture, African culture, you don't talk to your parents about dating, uh, but until you're very serious. And I said, you know, I told her, you know, who he was and that he was of Haitian um, heritage. And immediately she went on Vivian and told me about how we are common Europeans and not in Haitians because of our history of struggle, resistance on uh, 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 whites, and then uh, how we, you know, remained poor but really proud people because uh, of the fight we led, which didn't really contribute much to our physical, you know, development as countries, but uh, mentally uh, remain, remain strong. Um, so that's a little bit of what Black History Month means to me, a lot. <laughs> well, uh, Rapka, you have opened up so many things that we could possibly talk about. Uh, mm -hmm. The first thing is uh, from, first of all, a powerful story about you and your teacher. And I think, uh, I, I don't even want to assume why that could have been you know, why he would have reacted that way. It's possible that he didn't know the contribution of Ethiopia in that part of history. But, you know, the question I have to, it's not even a question, a statement I want to make is sometimes when we talk about Black History Month, yes, it's focused on, uh, you know, African-American contributions and experiences, but then the story of an African-American does not start with the United States it starts from the continent of Africa. So for, uh, you as an immigrant uh, from Ethiopia and uh, someone who is passionate about, you know, connecting culture and people, uh, what are your thoughts about, uh, you know, black history in the context of similarity in cultures between the, the African from who just came here in, better terms or on better terms to the United States and uh, somebody who is an ancestor from slavery. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there is really a very strong co a connection, right, in terms of history and, and, and culture. Uh, African-Americans did not exist without, without Africans. So I like the fact that you want to start there in terms of Af Africans. Um, so they were Africans uh, before they became um, slaves. So we really have to be intentional that when we talk about African-American culture, we don't start from, from slavery. There's so much depth and history and culture that precedes uh, them coming here um, as slaves. And then that continues because throughout their history here, they have celebrated their, their African culture to some extent retain their language and, and their religious uh, practices and, uh, and other customs. So, um, and so for, for me, uh, you know, as, uh, as, a, as an African and coming here and really, really thinking about the connection of um, Africa and, and really uh, from an Ethiopian perspective and also the history here. One of the things that I'm reminded of that was like aha moment for me, you know, that I took, you know, just uh, basically for granted was Richard Pryor, I used to like Richard, I think it was Richard Pryor, um, when he went to, uh, to Africa on his first uh, flight to Africa and, and that he observed, wait a minute, the pilot is African. The co-pilot is African. <laughs> Africans, black people, and then he lands. Uh, I don't remember where it was going, either Nigeria or Ghana. I don't remember now. And you know, everyone that he interacted in senior positions were were black folks, and how that really shaped his thinking 
and you know thought about maybe shouldn't use the n word anymore because he realized his very very strong has heritage um and so i think that in a way is also reflecting back where you come where where you started from uh, vivian that we don't start our history from uh, from slavery we have a lot of uh, depth in, in who we are um so for for me as an as an ethiopian with very strong history with the with the second oldest civilization in the world after China, and with the first, first Black a consistent civilization in the world. Um, and we're the only, we have the oldest Bible in the world, um, and with no parts removed. And people have to travel to uh, Ethiopia to look at the oldest uh, uh, um, Bible in the world. So all those are very, very rich history. So when I hear about people thinking that, that uh, Christianity is white people's um, um, religion. And I said, do you know about Ethiopian Orthodox? Do you know about the history of the Ethiopian church? Uh, and then I started telling people, it's like, it is not, of course, it, Jesus was not blue eyed and, and blonde and, and, and all that. So Jesus looked more like us than he did. But a lot of history has been uh, adulterated, right? Uh, just like I gave you an example of how you instantly switch from, oh, the great Roman Empire to, oh, you know, they were defeated by Ethiopians. It doesn't mean anything. They were not great warriors anyway. So quickly dismissing. So I think, uh, so bringing to awareness the history and the culture um, that we have uh, further connects us in, and continues to really instill pride uh, pride in us. Um, I would say one of the greatest history and contribution was um, a group of Ethiopian merchants arrived in, in the US um, in Wall Street in 1808. Um, and while they were there yeah, as merchants, one of the things that they did was attend a church. Um, so they went to the first Baptist church on Wall Street. And when they entered the church, they were kind of supernatural service um, where white people sat and then they were guided to go to the backside and sit separately with blacks. And, and they said, why? And it's like, oh, that's where black people sit. Oh, and they walked out. It's like, this is totally unacceptable. This is not just a very foreign practice for us. So we're not staying here in a house of worship and be as segregated in that way. So when they walked out, actually uh, African-Americans from the church also walked out. And then the group established uh, what became Abyssinia Church. And, um, and the first um, uh, preacher uh, for the Abyssinia Church is the well, very well-known Adam uh, Powell, Adam Clayton Powell Sr. Uh, he was the first church, he was the first um, preacher there. Now the church has moved to, to Harlem and I think it's a good idea that it moved to Harlem, bigger space. And the, the, the preacher now is Reverend Butts, who is amazing also. And not too long ago, they celebrated the 200 history, your history of the establishment of that church, of the senior church. And actually they had airplanes full of people, congregants come to Ethiopia for about two week uh, uh, visit. And, um, and further enriching the connection between the African-American church and Ethiopian, Af and Ethiopian church. And they were very well received there. And when they returned back here to the US, the Ethiopian, amb the Ethiopian ambassador in, uh, in Washington DC held a reception for them. And one of my dear colleague, Evelyn Neal, who is the, the widow, of Dr. Uh, Neil, who was uh, part, part of the Black Panther movement and also um, a professor at Yale and a very well-known poet, uh, I connected with her and to this day we remain uh, friends. And I'm like in awe, it's like, oh my God, I have a colleague that <laughs> is a friend that is from the Black Panther movement period. And, uh, and she goes to the Abyssinia church. So every time I go to New York to visit her, we go to the church and listen to Reverend Butts and everybody else. And you know, any president that is gonna be a president uh, in, in the US, Ghost of the senior church where they go to, to, to New York is that influential. And my and I took my cousins um, to uh, Harlem and to visit Mrs. Uh, O'Neill. And um, and they took a tour of her beautiful uh, house, Brownstone, uh, in Harlem, and look admiring their pictures. 
They were like so thrilled. They were like little kids. Oh my God. We actually met a live person that was part of the <laughs> summer rights movement. And uh, so it's just like we love all the movement that has happened um, with African Americans because they, in a way they paved the way for us. So in reverse, when we during the uh, the the war uh, uh, World War II, we actually have African American Air Force warriors. I mean, they didn't have any reputation here; they couldn't really fight here. But actually, they uh, on their own ended up really serving um, uh, with us, alongside with Ethiopians um, in uh, helping liberate um, Ethiopia um, from um, Italian um, invasion. So there are all these uh, stories about the, the relationship. And if you want to go you know, a little further, Frederick Douglass, uh, when he, in, in his speech on um, uh, who, who to the slave is the 4th of July, which is really a popular one. He said, Africa must rise and put on her yet unwoven garment and Ethiopia shall raise her hands to the God, just as it says in the Bible. Um, so there is continuous reference to Ethiopia and, and liber in terms of liber liber liberation because we're the only uh, you know, country that has been uncolonized. So those are a few examples. I was actually just going to mention that about Ethiopia. And that's why I think that's how the different countries and heads of state in the African continent decided to put the, uh, the African Union headquarters in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. So uh, it's, it's been, it was surreal the few times I've been in Ethiopia, just stepping on land that I know has never colonized. Um, so that is amazing. And, uh, but let's go back to some of the issues that you've mentioned. Oh my God, there has been so much, I don't even know where to start. But let's talk about the culture and the connection between um, African or Africa, the continent of Africa, what it is today anyway, and uh, the slave, the, the first slaves say in the United States. And the reason I'm bringing it, this up is because I want us to reflect on what life could have been when they got here the first time. So they were, you know, picked up from the coasts of Africa in different parts. But when they, by the time they reached to America, you know, they had been stripped of their families, stripped of their identity, stripped of language because they had to be forced to speak a different, you know, to learn a new language. So to give up their own identities in terms of language. So uh, with all of these things stripped and, you know, what does, how did that, create in your opinion of course the african american tradition or culture because once they they had to re redefine themselves and create a culture where they could identify each other and this is why where we come across the different terminology that can only be found in the african american community so in your perspective how was that shaped um, so I want to go back to and I, again to um, to Africa where this all um, started. And we talked about the rich history and culture, um, but part of um, that history and culture is really facing our um, misgivings, our um, poor um, history. Um, that we have, um, and and that is that we were part of. Uh, what led to um, slavery, um, and and it was not um, it it was through the manipulation right of the Arabs and also white people, but black folks and Africans were part of the group that actually gathered Africans uh, for 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 slavery, um, and but that is you know when you really think about then why why did that happen? It's all about persuasion by. Uh, you know the 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 whites uh, the Europeans and also by the Arabs, but it also is about money. You know when you are poor, there are things that you are forced to do or tend to do that you have a lot of misgivings later on. So I want you know so I want to really face it and talk about that because you know 
there are people at that point immediately like, oh, we don't want to take ownership back. You know, Africans themselves sold, sold their people. So you really need to put it in context is because of the fact of, of poverty and persuasion and, and, and they were forced to, um, to do that. So then of course they traveled a, a long distance here and they do not know, they've never been outside or forget about being out. They haven't even, most of them have never been outside their little village. And so, you know, even going, to another city is a foreign concept to them, let alone going all the way to the US. So many lives were lost across. So, so once they al- arrived here, the, the slavery, the cruelty that they endured, and they persistently though, you know, fought for the liberation. So these are not people that just conformed to their way of life. Many women and men lost their lives um, you know, whether, you know, you're talking about, you know, with Harriet Tubman or others or before the Underground Railroad or throughout the system of Underground Railroad and beyond. And to this day, we're fighting, you know, resisting the power that uh, suppresses us, that sees us as unequal. We're talking about 2022. So the way they can preserve their identity once it's stripped for them is in any shape or form to, and when they are amongst each other, to talk in language that they were not allowed to talk um, and to practice their cultural um, practices, uh, celebration, music, and also you know, using codes through their music to communicate, right? Isn't that what the Underground Railroad is, is really about? So to this day, you know, when you wade in the water is one of my favorite. And I, and I used to think that it's just like, oh, that beautiful hymn, beautiful song, until I found out there were like messages of Underground Railroad that was and that beautiful song I've always loved, Wade in the Water. And um, so they preserved it. I can imagine that the struggle that they went through um, um, to uh, to be deprived of, of, of who they are. Um, and I really honored them for their resistance all these years and, and, pre- and preserving their culture. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I've there is one time recently somebody was asking me, you know, a question. I think it's one of those cases where um, people are saying, hey, you know, slavery ended so many years ago. You know, why? And we've seen Black people are allowed to do whatever they want now. Uh, there is no more segregation. We've moved on. And there is no more, you know, that that ha- happened so many years ago. So uh, have you come across such uh, similar sentiments or conversations? And what is your perspective? Or yeah, what can you talk to? What can you talk about, you know, the ways that part of the remnants of that mistreatment are still present today, I guess? When we look at redlining and, and, and how real estate is, is really defined, that is a perfect example that we have not eliminated racism. When we look at how police treat our, our people, we have not eliminated racism. I mean, you know, Floyd, that whole incident that just erupted in the Black Lives Matter that, that came out of that as a result is to really part of that fighting the power that exists to suppress our people. I am the mother of two black boys, raising two black boys in the suburbs of Baltimore City, Baltimore that has a high, you know, a violence rate. I lived every day in fear when my sons left um, and, uh, you know, left the house. And I sigh of relief whenever they return because I knew the dangers out there as black uh, as black men. Um, so we look at it, the academic educational gap that that exists and continues. Look at the wealth gap that exists and continues. Uh, so we have nowhere reach any sense of equity um, in uh, in the United States between black brown uh, black and brown people um, here in the United States. So the war has not been finished. Um, We're not there. We have a long way to go. And I'm reminded, actually, you know, in in history, when remember when um, um, MLK uh, became a a holiday, his birthday became a a holiday. And I had a colleague 
um, I was working at that time and there was a lady, an elderly lady that would call for counseling on a regular basis. And uh, when it was announced that it was going to be a, 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 a holiday, a national holiday, she said to me, I will never forget, this was way back, right? And she said, um, you know, I don't understand why we need to have this holiday. I mean, what has uh, Martin Luther King done for you? And I was like, what has it done for me? Not only for me as an immigrant, but what has it done for black people? What has it done for you as white people? Uh, it was really what I wanted to say. I said, he's done so much. I don't have the time to really articulate everything that he has done. If it wasn't for his struggle, if it wasn't for the struggle many of our civil rights movement leaders and also the whites and Jews that, that died in their process, we as immigrants and African Americans would not have the privilege that we have to come here and work and be in a profession um, that we are, are pursuing, pursuing. So it is, it is real, it is a fight, it is war. And when I think about it, it really it is about, it is about war and not, not in terms of the physical, well, there's a physical sense, right? We're having war um, in, in, you know, and, 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 but also in the mental sense and, then, and also how we have policies that really is not equal um, at all. Um, so when I think about war and when I think about, again, about the, the relationship uh, between uh, Africa and Ethiopia and, and African-Americans and, and, and culture, I am reminded, you know, you mentioned about the African Union, I am reminded of Haile Selassie and the influence that he had. I mean, his vision was to create the African Union, right? Um, because he, you know, Ethiopia was very instrumental in the movement of Africans to liberate themselves. And because of many African countries are really appreciative, our flag is really used by, you know, many other African countries like Ghana and others. Uh, and oh, Nelson Mandela is very thankful to, uh, to the emperor. So one of the things about the emperor was, um, this, uh, when the Italians came to um, to uh, Ethiopia once again uh, to take on, because they were really embarrassed in 1896 when they lost, they said they they vowed they'll be back, and they came back. And uh, uh, and Emperor Haile Selassie is the only head of state that uh, delivered speech both at the League of Nations and at the United Nations. We were both in the League of Nations and part of the group that started these. Uh, multilateral institutions. So he went to appeal um, to the League of Nations uh, about uh, what was happening in his country with the invasion um, um, of Ita Ita Italians in Ethiopia. And the speech that he made, if you have not listened to that speech, you must listen to it. It is so amazing. It is so profound that um, uh, um, Bob Marley turned it into a very popular song called What's the, song? the war it's called war and please allow me just to uh, just to share a bit of the speech and really think about how even to this day it has implications um so this is this is part of the speech and this is included in um Bob Marley's song war so until the philosophy which holds one race superior and another inferior is finally and permanently discredited and abandoned, that until they are no longer first class and second class citizens of any nation, that until the color of a man's skin is of no more significance than the color of his eyes, that until the basic human rights are equally guaranteed to all without regard to race, that until that day, the dream of lasting peace and world citizenship and the rule of international morality will remain, but a fleeting illusion to be pursued but never attained. And until the ignoble and unhappy regiments that hold our brothers and in Angola, in Mozambique, and in South Africa in subhuman bondage have been toppled and destroyed until bigotry and prejudice and malicious and human 
in human self-interest have been replaced by understanding and tolerance and goodwill until all Africans stand and speak as free beings equal in the eyes of all men as they are in the eyes of heaven. Until that day, the African continent will not know peace. We Africans will fight if necessary. And we, the last and I'll close, and we, uh, and we know that we shall win. We are, as we are confident in the victory of good over evil. So that is just That's part powerful. of it. Isn't that powerful? It is really amazing. And the great uh, Marcus Garvey also, you know, had similar um, saying and that Bob Marley also used in his song. And it was, I'm sure you know it, it's like emancipate yourself from mental slavery, none but ourselves can free our mind. How powerful. And of course, Marcus Garvey was, you know, close follower of Haile Selassie and the movement, the Pan-African movement to go back um, um, to Africa. So that is the great connection uh, that we have in the struggle that still remains and then that still um, continues on to this day. Right. Uh, well, again, so many powerful things that you have mentioned. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to keep up on where to go next. But let me start with the connection, the power of connection, and with Bob Marley, because, you know, just looking at him as one of the known figures of the Rastafarian uh, kind of identity. And I knew Ethiopia has a huge part of the Rastafarian identity. So could you kindly make that connection for other for our viewers? And two, as again, talking about cultures, in what ways can uh, African Americans and immigrants, recent immigrants from Africa, how can they help each other, learn from each other and support each other in this struggle for equity in the United States? Oh, okay, all right, very good. So yeah, the Rasta movement. Um, so there is a prophecy that uh, there will be a king that will come out of Africa and he'll be the great redeemer. So when um, Haile Selassie was crowned emperor um, in 1933 or 35, sorry, <laughs> they just uh, escaping me. Um, uh, the Jamaicans uh, saw this. Wow, it, it must be Haile Selassie. And his name before he became Haile Selassie, before the crowning, was Rastafari. So, uh, so those that end up decided to follow him and follow the prophecy and see him as that prophet decided to call themselves Rastafarians. Uh, Bob Marley did not become a Rastafarian until later. So in, 19, in the 1960s, um, Haile Selassie went to, uh, to Jamaica and, um, and prior to that, there was like um, the huge drought in, um, in Jamaica. Um, and there were people really suffering. And when Haile Selassie's uh, plane landed, there was huge rain, storm, it's just like all the floodgates open in the sky and the rain fall down. It's like, oh my goodness, here's another confirmation that this is the prophecy. This is our <laughs> redeemer. <laughs> so what happened was, I, and um, from that point on, Bob Marley decided to become a Rastafarian. Um, he was convinced <laughs> this is who the, the, the savior is. And let me just tell you that Haile Selassie, the emperor was a bit taken back because when he arrived and he saw the massive number of people that were there, it's like, what is going on? I can't, I, you know, what is this? And um, so he was like very much pleased by the, by the reception that he got. And actually he said, told Jamaicans to come and that he will give them land um, in, in Ethiopia. And so right from that point on, Shashamene, which is not far distance from Addis Ababa, is a whole community of Rastafarians that have lived for many, many years with land that was given uh, by um, by Haile Selassie. And even before that, um, in 1935, Haile Selassie and diplomats that he sent here, you know, said, African-Americans come, come to, to uh, Ethiopia, settle in Ethiopia, we will give you land. I mean, we have Ghana doing that now, but back then Haile Selassie promised 800 acres of land in Ethiopia for African-Americans to, 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 to come and, and live and, and work. 
in terms of relationship between um, African and African Americans, you know, so this conversation, as I said before, is really about honesty. There, we have a long way to go in terms of building relationship between Africans and African Americans. I remember growing up, uh, Vivian, that um, in my in my school, when someone brought ebony or essence, it was like so exciting so our recess time will be gathering about this one single ebony or one single essence uh someone would bring and like you know what 60 80 100 of us will be just rolling through the essence and ebony and like looking at african americans like wow look look at the way they there is look at you know so we were in awe and i remember also of uh, Mode Squad, you know, uh, you, I'm dating myself. So this was like 60s or so Mode Squad. There were a black guy who was a detective. And it's like, wow, to see that was quite interesting. Um, but in many instances, the media portrays each other's um, co continent un unfairly. Um, so what, for the most part, what we saw was bad representation of African Americans and also what African Americans saw of Africa is all the 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 the, the violence or uh, the jungles, the women the disease, jungle, the animals, flies uh, on kids' faces. <laughs> that and to this day we do have that kind of uh feeling towards uh, towards each other but also remember the principle of divide and conquer or divide and rule uh which happens so there is this division and sometimes it's, it really is intentional to this day i see some of that division happening and i t i tend to fight it or not accept it uh, at all and so i think the only way that we can come together as africans and african americans together is by working together and, and getting to know each other and African Americans going to Africa and I'm you know what Ghana is doing is really amazing and I think other African countries should learn from from what they're doing and also the same thing of us and really connecting really making sure that we are intentional that we serve African American communities that we're connected and we attend events that are African American and organize collectively so I am uh, with the constituency for Africa um, which is an advocacy group um, that with long history. Melvin Foote has been leading that, that uh, constitution for Africa for many, many years. And then uh, the intention is to really bridge this gap between Africans and African-Americans. And it's advocacy. fantastic. Isn't it fantastic? Yeah. yeah, so that is one. And then I'm also a member of uh, 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 Black, uh, prof uh, Black Professional in International Affairs. Um, so... And again, that's another group that really tries to create awareness and bridge the, the gap uh, between these uh, different different groups. I'm um, also, you know, with Ameri uh, American Ethiopian uh, Public Affairs Committee. And even though recently it was uh, ended up being a, little, a pol political movement trying to deal with the TPLF and Ethiopian conflict that has been happening, but it's really the, uh, the, the establishment was really to bridge the gap that exists um, between Ethiopia and, and Africa and, um, and harmonize that. And I remember, I think I mentioned that before, that Dr. Sullivan years ago in the 70s and 80s, 90s, used to actually hold uh, an annual conference that brings Africans and African-Americans together right. to raise awareness and celebrate who we are. I really think that we need an intentional effort effort uh, like that to make to make the things happen. Um, and so it, I'm, I'm, that is the part that I'm doing through Constituency for Africa, through APAC, uh, through uh, Black professional and international affairs, um, you know, trying to uh, really bridge that. And also I am um, working on strengthening African uh, universities by um, working with African university universities here, bringing them together. But I'm also really thinking about reverse education. So education is not just African universities learning from uh, uh, universities here. And I'm intentional about, about really engaging HBCUs such as Morgan is involved, uh, Del uh, Delaware State is involved, North Carolina State. So really engaging them and others. But it's really also about how Africa, you know, universities right here in America can benefit from education from 
African universities. So uh, it's not it's not unidirectional. You do not own, you know, academic intellect all by yourself right here. There's so much wealth and information that actually can also come from from Afri Africa. So those are some of the things that that um, that I am doing or engaged in, you know, leading that 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 partnership. This is a fantastic segue into, you know, the, one of the, the final things I'll just speak to today before I let you go. I mean, there is a lot to talk about. We can have, sub, you know, a series of conversations like this, and I look forward to it, actually. But um, when we, you mentioned earlier that, um, you know, the, part of that is history and education that is missing uh, in for example, in America, about you know Afri contributions of African and African American uh, African Americans, but I want to focus a little bit on Africa, where you say people say that hey, the Africans are the ones who sold the slaves. Much of the history of the rebellions against colonialism is not told. For example, we have this fantasy movie Black Panther. But you know the story of the Black Panther. I, I know you mentioned about the real Black Panthers in the U U.S., but there it's a real story of uh, the Amazon ladies, or ba we assume it's based on the Dahomey. Uh, but this Dahomey was just one group of uh, females, especially now we are about to get into the Women's Month, who mm -hmm. fought for their communities. And we have a series of rebellions and uh, some of them were women led across the continent of Africa during the colonial times, during slave trade times that they passionately fought for their communities. And I think history is not crediting them the way that they should be credited. And part of that history when yes, they lost many people, but the I'm really owed by the strong women, especially who fought mm -hmm. this uh, colonialism and uh, slave trade. So <laughs> I don't know if you have anything to add before I let you go, but yes. I, I, I <laughs> go on. Yes. Uh, I guess Vivian and us women love the support of us, uh, of our men. And here is my husband walking with a warm cup of coffee for me. So oh. uh, thank you, my dear. Uh, but um, yes, I mean, you, you mentioned about uh, the uh, Black Panthers, the, the movement, the women representation, who they represent. You know, in a way, okay, call us whatever, but we own... <laughs> like the Black Panthers, because we said that story is about Ethiopia. Uh, seriously, <laughs> people say that because in the movie it talks about the, being the only non-colonized um, country. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, so I was like, okay, then where is that? That, that is uh, in Ethiopia. So that's how we actually um, <laughs> own it in a way. Uh, but I want to say, you know, it's 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 not about pride, but it's really unfortunate that many African countries were colonized, um, and and they were colonized because we're very loving and trusting people. So there is a saying that said like, um, when they came, they had the Bible and we had the land, mm -hmm. and when they left, we had the Bible and they had our land. Um, so who the Europeans sent in advance to just calm us down is like churches, people representing um, churches uh, or uh, reverence and stuff were sent to really, you know, spy on land, you know, calm people down, bring them religion and pacify us. And then before we knew it, our land were, you know, was gone. In Ethiopia, we, you know, so, that that lack of trust of foreign land. Let me just share with you one thing about um, Theodros would say any white visitor that comes and, and, and left Ethiopia, he will hold them, he will have uh, people take off their shoes or their sandals, wipe their sandals clean, wash it, wash their feet, because he told them not a drop of land, soil of Ethiopia will depart with you. Okay. Wow. So that is part of resistant movement. That is part of not trusting them 
and, and we're isolated in terms of we're the Switzerland of Africa because we're the most mountainous country um, in, in Africa, so highly impenetrable. And also, even though we're very loving and, and hospitable, we are very, also very suspicious. So that kind of also protected us. And also because we had religion already, you don't have, need to bring religion to really pacify us. So we know So that was not a way to, to trap us. But going to the piece about women, um, I'm so glad you brought that because women's history is never valued in any country, seriously. We have so, Women's Month coming in. I'm bringing you back to just focus on the... <laughs> Let's do it. Okay, so before we close, I need to tell you about one of our phenomenal leaders and actually her husband. And, um, you know, so earlier I told you about 1896 when... Um, Ethiopia defeated on the Italians. Okay, the ruler was Emperor Menelik. Um, he was the ruler. His wife was Empress Taitu. The thing about that's really honorable about that marriage, about that relationship, was that Menelik treated his, uh, his empress wife as his equal. He had great respect for her and for her knowledge. Mm -hmm. To the... Uh, irritation of his you know, military staff. So he would really listen to her. So she was actually the person that came with the strategy how to encircle the Italians yeah. and defeat them. Yeah. And so when she presented to you know, Menelik her idea about how to defeat Italians and, and Menelik said, hmm, okay, that seems to make sense. We'll do it, we'll do it your way. And his people, the military, like, what? No way. We're not going to be listening to a woman. We, she doesn't know what she's doing. We're the military strategist. And, and the emperor said, I'm listening to her. You go do what she said to, for you to do. Right. And then, of course, defeat. Absolutely. <laughs> <And> empress, Absolutely. <laughs> empress died to rule. And she's one of our favorite, favorite leaders of our in history. So Menelik didn't really win. It is actually Empress Men, <laughs> Empress who won. But, you know, history mostly talks about, you know, oh, Menelik won, but no, Empress won. And we have like movies and, you know, dramas about, and songs about uh, the Empress, but she is one of many uh, uh, female uh, warriors that we, uh, we celebrate. But again, you're saying it's not enough and we can come back and talk, uh, talk more about that absolutely come next month we're going to come up with a schedule we're going to talk about all the strong women uh, whether warriors and leaders of um, different uh, resistances and leaders who really fought for motherland africa uh, because i think uh, for as long as we are alive it's our duty to bring that store those stories uh, to the to the front line so that they are acknowledged especially as us being women as well uh, that's the best we can do to pay tribute to them <laughs> yes yes, yes let's yeah. do that. but let's anyway our women our black women everywhere yeah, yeah. so anyway as uh, as I sign off there's one thing that I wanted to mention to say thank you to Ethiopia for giving to the rest of the world and that was coffee because I know it originated in Ethiopia. So yeah, yeah. And your husband just got <laughs> you coffee. And I was like, oh, I mean, I need some of that coffee right now. Hopefully when we, we meet and visit, I can have some of the Ethiopian uh, coffee, but yeah. Absolutely. I don't know. Absolutely, that would be a pleasure because coffee, the word coffee comes from kafa, which is the word place where coffee originated from so Absolutely. yeah so there's that 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 connection and of course we have Ethiopian Airlines that will flies in fresh Ethiopian coffee on a reg uh, all the time and again Ethiopian Airlines the most profitable airlines in Africa so, so again so yeah. <laughs> again so like trying to just shed a little bit of light of some of the black history and contributions to the world and coffee is one of them no country thrives without coffee and this is where the, it originated so oh, really? with that really is as always it's a pleasure to host you Repka to talk passionately about history Africa uh, culture and diversity and I look forward to bring you on again next time but for now thank you so much and happy black history month
Thank you. And the same to you, Vivian. It's always a pleasure because I had an opportunity to talk about my passion about Africa, African Americans, and how we coexist and grow together and strengthen. It's it's a passion of mine. And I thank you for that opportunity. All right. Thank you. And to our viewers, thank you for watching. Till next time. Mm -hmm.